Over 2,000 people are dead in Morocco this morning. What help are we providing? Well, it's an absolutely appalling uh, situation, and we stand ready to provide whatever assistance is required. We have a strong record, whether it was in the Turkish uh, appalling uh, disaster that took place or, or others. We will do whatever we can. We have certain expertise in terms of search and rescue. We stand ready to do what we can. I know the Foreign Office are in close contact with our counterparts uh, in that country. And the Moroccans have uh, said what they wanted yet? Well, I think, as I say, this is a matter that the Foreign Office are leading on, but um, I've been absolutely assured that we stand ready to do whatever we can and those contacts are in place. Um, there's another issue that uh, has arisen this morning which might indeed land up in your plate as uh, Secretary of State for Justice. Um, it's reported that Parliament has been infiltrated by a Chinese spy or at least someone working uh, for China who had a parliamentary pass. I know you can't say anything about the specific mm. case, but there's an interesting point here. Parliamentary passes are pretty difficult to get. I don't have one. Um, is it time to review the allocation of these passes? Because this isn't the first time something like this has happened. Well, look, I, I, firstly, we've got to take this in stages. You say it may end up on my desk. Obviously, there's a police investigation. It could be that independent prosecutors have to look at it and we shouldn't say anything which could jeopardise uh, those uh, proceedings. But there is a rigorous uh, approach that is taken in terms of being provided with passes. But plainly, this has got to play through in terms of this investigation. And whatever lessons need to be learnt by the parliamentary authorities, I'm sure will be learned, but it is important to take it in stages. Indeed, but um, you wouldn't rule out the possibility that we that there may be weaknesses in the system that we need to address. I don't think you should rule anything out. I absolutely. And, you know, the Prime Minister has been very clear when it comes to China, it's an epoch-defining threat, yet a challenge, forgive me. So, of course, we've got to take it extremely seriously. And I know uh, the police and no doubt other agencies will take it uh, seriously as well, and uh, let's let's learn whatever lessons need to be learned. I, I won't pick you up too much on the Freudian slip of China being <laughs> a threat, um, but I suspect that's what uh, many in Parliament think. Look, I mean, there is no you can't wish China away. China is the world's second biggest economy. If we are going to meet the challenge of climate change, we can't do it without China. They're responsible for about 27, 28 percent of emissions. We're about one percent. So we have to engage, but we do so with our eyes open. And that's why we take steps like to ensure that Huawei is out of our 5G network, at the same time recognising there is a sensible engagement to have, and that's the position that we're in. Do you, uh, do you know if Mr Cleverly uh, raised the issue of China's spying, the Confucius Institutes, which they've set up, uh, the use of students spying on other students, which we now know is true. Did Mr Cleverly raise this when he was in Beijing last week? Well, I, know? I, I haven't had specific conversations with, uh, with James Cleverly about that, but from speaking to him, and I, I speak, sit around the um, cabinet table with him, you know, James and indeed the whole British government, as I say, are very clear and very clear-eyed. We will raise matters with the Chinese that are of concern to us, along the lines potentially that you referred to, and that's fine. What you can't do, it seems to us, is to step back and say, well, second biggest economy, critical, by the way, to the lives and the livelihoods of people in our country and have no engagement. So we think it's practical and pragmatic to do so, but to make sure we stand up for our values, that we assert the value of the rule of law, we assert the value of human rights, whilst ensuring that we have that sensible engagement because the lives and livelihoods of our people uh, can be dependent upon that relationship as well. All right, let's turn to the story which has no doubt been occupying much of your time this week. You've commissioned, I think, four inquiries into the escape of Daniel Khalif. If he did have help from prison staff, we have no idea about that yet, or another prisoner, are you confident that the scope of the reviews that you have set out will, review, will reveal who and how he was helped? Well, let me just step back for a second. First of all, I want to thank the police. You've done an absolutely excellent uh, uh, job. Uh, second, I think it is also important to stress that these are very, very rare uh, incidents, but we take them extremely seriously, which is why I set up the inquiries that you uh, referred to, to look into the circumstances of the apparent escape, uh, but, but also issues about categorisation. And I ask for there to be preliminary findings on my desk by the end of the week. That's this week. And uh, I am able to say, although, of course, we have to tread carefully because it may be that there are criminals' proceedings in due course, but I am able to say that on the issue of whether there were protocols in place, that's to say protocols about when after food has been unloaded from a van that the proper headcount takes place before you can 
call the control room, for example, protocols about whether there's a proper search apparatus to go under, to look underneath the vehicle. Those protocols were in place, point one. And point two, staff, the relevant security staff, were also in place. Now, plainly, what we have yet to establish is whether those protocols were uh, followed. And that's what the investigation will, uh, will take place. But one thing I do want to stress, is, if, if I just very quickly want to stress, is yes, we've got those thorough internal investigations, but I've also asked for an independent investigation as well, so that we can be absolutely satisfied that the conclusions that are drawn are rock solid. Out of, that the uh, protocols were there. We don't know if they were observed. It does seem utterly bizarre to the outside observer that this could have happened. It's, it, it, I mean, if it wasn't so serious, it would be almost comic. Well, it's extremely serious. And, and you know, that's why the moment it was brought to my attention, I wanted to speak to the, the governor, and I, and I resolved that we should uh, set up these uh, inquiries. But as I say, these investigations... And, and you're is... confident that the governor knows what, I think, it's a she. Is it's a she, here. yeah. Yes, look, absolutely. I'm absolutely confident in the senior leadership of the prison service to conduct a rigorous searching and fair investigation. And I've also, as I say, got this independent investigation as well. But on these core... Uh, but I, you're you're not telling me you have confidence in the Governor of Wandsworth. Well, what I'm saying about the position of the Governor of Wandsworth is that I have absolute confidence in the senior leadership to get to the bottom of who did their job. You know, we want to absolutely work out were the protocols followed as they should be, and that should, of course, apply, uh, apply to everyone. And it will be searching and it will be fair, but it is something, as I say, that you need to take thoroughly and you need to take in stages. And I just also want to, uh, to make the point, if I, if I may briefly, that we are moving at great pace, and I hope to be able to announce next week uh, the terms of reference for the independent investigation that I've referred to. All right, you, you mentioned a moment ago the issue of categorisation. Mm. Now, Khalif was in what is called a Category B prison, which are training prisons and local prisons. Uh, quite serious places. I've been in Wandsworth. Uh, but they're not high security like Belmarsh. This will be part of the review, but just... You must know the answer to this. Now, do you know who would have allocated him to a Category B prison? Well, as you say, this is part of the review, but what uh, tends to happen is those people who uh, have certain... are accused, of course, not convicted, accused of certain offences will be considered for categorisation. But this is an important point, that although it's, uh, of course, a very serious matter, it's not without its complexity. So, for example, it's not the case, as it were, that everybody who was to be charged with a specific offence under a specific piece of legislation would automatically go into a certain category of prison. It will depend upon the circumstances, first of all, to do with the risk that they would pose were they to be... Uh, rel were they to, were they to I, escape. Do, do I, you see I, the point? I, I, get, I yeah. get the point, mm. but uh, there isn't that much room for doubt when someone is charged with a terror offence. I mean, this was a very... Serious offence. Now, we may find that actually it, it isn't as serious as it looks, but on the face of it, this is as well, serious look, as it gets. Well, look, at, and at, at, why is he in a Category B prison? And so this is absolutely what I want uh, to get to the bottom of, and that's precisely why I set up uh, the investigation, this searching investigation. As I say, the only point I just want to gently make is that it's not entirely without this complexity. I mean, my, my background is as a, a lawyer. One yep. of the offences that uh, is charged with Section 58A, but, you know, Section 58 of the Terrorism Act 2000, uh, of, of course anything under the Terrorism Act is extremely serious, but it is possible for people to charge, be charged with that of, uh, offence who the police and the prosecution accept has got no terrorist uh, ideology at all, but is in possession of material that they ought not to be in possession of. So, now, well, let's not get into the details of this because this person will have to stand trial, but equally, all I'm saying is that there might be someone charged under, I don't know, the Criminal Damage Act, for example, and yet they are serial arsonists, allegedly, arson with intent to endanger life, and plainly there are different risk, risk matrix there. So, uh, we just have to look at the okay, facts, I'm, and I wanted I'm, to take I'm not going to drag you into the individual case, but let me ask you a more general question. Sure. Um, do you know how many uh, individuals charged under Section 5 or Section, Section 58, the, yeah. the terrorism uh, offences, uh, are in Category B prisons rather than Category A prisons? Well, look, what, what, I, what I can say is in respect of Wandsworth, because I wanted to ensure out of an, an abundance of caution that that uh, a prison, that every resource is put into that prison to get to the bottom of what happened and to ensure uh, that security is, uh, is preserved, is that out of an abundance of caution that some uh, prisoners there, some of those, of those on remand, have been uh, moved. And that is, as I say, out of, out of an abundance of caution. So you caution. mean moved this week? 
Yes, because I wanted uh -huh. to make... Yeah, so I, additional resources, of course, gone into Wandsworth, so there's additional uh, governor support, a former governor with particular uh, expertise in security, but also, out, as I say, out of an abundance of caution, around 40 prisoners have been moved to, just while we get to the bottom of what took place in Wandsworth. Right. That is a sensible uh, precautionary measure, as I say, out of an abundance of caution. So you've moved people from Wandsworth who you think might be threats, who should no. probably might not belong there. Uh, you still haven't quite answered my question. Do you know how many of these kinds of people charged with these very serious offences are in Category B prisons well, rather than the highest security prisons? Well, in your question, you mentioned two offences. You mentioned Section 5. So that's Section 5 of the Terrorism Act 2006. So that would be preparing an act of terrorism. Yeah. It is overwhelmingly likely that those who have been... Uh, charged with those matters will be uh, in Category A. Uh, is it the case that all those charged with Section 58 uh, being in possession of, of, of material which likely to be of assistance to a person planning an act of terrorism? That could be, as I say, somebody who has searched for something online who everyone accepts is not in and of themselves as somebody who is motivated by terrorism. It wouldn't be the case. And incidentally, that piece of legislation has been in force since 2000. So for the thick end of a quarter of a century, a categorization decisions have been made on a case-by-case -case basis. As I say, look, I, I, I just I want to make the point, I have, of course, concerns about this issue, which is precisely why I've set up uh, the investigation. I just want to make clear that there are complexities, that's I, all. I understand, but, um, you know, I don't want to get too fussy about language, but you've just used the phrase overwhelmingly likely. What that tells me is that nobody in your department actually knows the answer to the question I asked you, which is how many of these uh, people who are charged with these serious offences are in Category B rather than Category A offences? And presumably, when you complete your review, that is one of the questions you're going to be asking. Is that right? And is the decision-making on this appropriate? Right. So this is really important, uh, important matter because you have people who are on remand, but you also have serving prisoners. So although you're talking about a trainer, that tends to be a Category C trainer. Now, people work their way through sentences, and it can be the case that somebody who starts in a Category A, as they are rehabilitated, as they get ready for release, that they move through the system. So that is an important part of, yes, of course, security is the number one priority. We also want to ensure that prisoners are rehabilit rehabilitated through the system. So that is precisely why I've asked for an investigation into the facts of this specific okay. case, the Khalif case, but also, also uh, an investigation into the wider system of categorisation, because these are legitimate questions which I want answers to as well. All right, let's talk about the wider system. I mean, um, one thing's clear, and I think you have acknowledged this yourself, we don't have enough prison staff. You're trying to recruit more. Of the ones that we do have, um, a lot of them are off sick. The number of uh, sick days claimed since 2018 uh, annually is up uh, 60%. And um, here's the most concerning thing, perhaps. Of those who are on duty, a high proportion are inexperienced. Overall, one in six are in their first year in the job. Add it up. Isn't this a system designed for a disaster? No, well, let me just step back for a second. The first thing to say is that uh, the condition of our prisons is, of course, very important. This is the government that has done more to put money where its mouth is to invest very heavily in our prisons. And here's a statistic which I think is important. The second biggest programme of government outside HS2 is in prison modernisation and expansion. I've got that. I'm going to come so, to the prison estate. I'm asking sure. you about the no, prison no, staff. No, no, and of course, but, it, but having also a safe and decent environment for prison staff as well is very important. And I, I meet prison staff, and I do just want to make this point. They do an exceptionally important job because people on those wings have to have the judgment to know when to hold the line and to be firm and robust so you have a safe prison, but also when to show compassion uh, when people are having going through difficulty. So just, but this is a really important... So that's why we've accepted the response of the Prison Service Pay Review Body to provide that 7%. That's why we are recruiting, and additionally, 700 people, additional people into the prison service since May of last year. And here's the really important point. The so-called attrition rate, you know what that means, you know, yes. effectively, is actually down. The rate at which leave, people, you've got it. people leave. I understand you've got, that. Exactly. So, so that but is down. But you're still down. That is way down. short well, we, of what you want. So I am absolutely clear and candid. We want to recruit more people. That is true. But if you look at the trajectory 
4,000 more since around 2006. And as I say, that isn't historic. We are on that trajectory as well. Oh. And, we are, and we have accepted these pay review because we accept they are ex really phenomenal people who do an extremely difficult job. We value them hugely. That's yeah. why I had hosted reception number 10 for them uh, uh, last week. And, and yeah. I really want to encourage people into the service. All right, but well, let's, let's talk about the conditions. Um, Overcrowding in Wandsworth, we're told, is running at about 75%. It means too many prisoners are locked up too many hours a day. Men are in cells designed for one person uh, with uh, a cellmate, which means that, let us be frank about it, they have to uh, defecate in front of other people. Now, you've got a building programme. It's going to add mm. uh, 20,000 places over the next four years. I want you to look at, look at this. Let's look at what your department predicts for the growth in the prison population over that period. Uh, right now, it's around about 85,000, and it will grow to, I think, 104,000. Now, 104,000, I know, is the top prediction, but it, it, that could be where you are. So you will add 20,000 uh, places, and you'll add 20,000 prisoners. So they will continue to be as overcrowded and shockingly bad conditions as they are now. So a few things to say. You, you talked about um, crowding. So if you go back uh, you know, 20, 25 years, the levels of, of so-called crowding are approximately the same in somewhere like Wandsworth. But the difference is we are the government that has been absolutely determined. And by the way, this prime minister, when he was chancellor, to put very significant money into it. And, it, and in the interest of balance, I think it's important to know, if you go to some of these modern prisons, so this isn't just saying, OK, we'll spend some money and hopefully we'll get some prisons. If you go, for example... Well, most of the state is not modern at all. No, ah, ah, but if you, if, if you go, to, for example, to HMP Bowen, if you go to HMP Five Wells or HMP Fossway, I would, I would love to take you there, Trevor. It is quite remarkable. So you go in, I want you to imagine if you would... You have extraordinary workshops where people can I, learn, you know, joinery. No, it's really a safe, decent yeah, rehabilitative but, prison. But, and that's what modernising the estate is about. But, Secretary, look, most prisons aren't like that. Actually, let, let, let me uh, show you something else. I don't want to do too much of a slideshow, but let me show you something else. Written by a leading Conservative figure in 2017. He said, in a decent society, prisons must be places of safety, they must be humane. Today, our prisons are far too violent and far too crowded. Society should not have a bleeding heart about its prisoners, but it shouldn't have blood on its hands either. That is very right? strong language. Yeah. And look, I, I, but I agree with every syllable of that. I, I absolutely agree. We should be robust, the safety of the public, but, but not, we want to have a humane... That's not where we are, is it? But it's precisely why we're investing so heavily. So, as I say, this £4 billion is important. But also, if I could just add one other thing, because you talked about prison say... officers. We're very quick. No, but just very... Because it matters. That's why we've invested £100 million to, for prisoner security. So that means yeah. that all the, the uh, officers have body-worn okay. videos, because that's how you dial down uh, the temperature in prison. But, by the way, do you know who this is? Well, it could be... Frankly, it could be any number of my excellent colleagues. Uh, actually, Is it me? Actually, it's you. Well, there you go. From and, in and your own constituency website. And I agree point, with it. I, I hear that your point about your ambitions, but we are now six years on from the time you made that statement. Yes. And you we, would acknowledge we are Trevor. nowhere near oh, that but, humane but, but, system. But what you we, would acknowledge that we are not in the humane should situation. Should I tell you where we are? We've got two brand new prisons no, that are set up, plus Millsike is being prisoners, constructed. You would acknowledge that your ambitions have not been met. Well, I, I, we've got further to do, but what I would also acknowledge is that there are 4,000 more officers since that time, that we've opened uh, Fossway, that we've opened Five okay. Wells, that Millsike is being built, that we've got uh, refurbishments taking place in house blocks in Liverpool, in Stockton, in Rye Hill, in Birmingham, that there's a huge amount okay. of effort that is going, and resource that is going right. into this. OK, you can go through all the prisons. Let me just ask you one other thing. I, I, there's so many other things I could talk oh, to you about is. prisons. Sure. Um, Including, by the way, that there have been seven prison ministers in the last uh, four years, which is well, another I thing. I was one of them. I know you were. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that might be part of the explanation for where we are. But I want to ask you about something that's come up today. The Prime sure. Minister said um, in Delhi yesterday that he wouldn't rule out squeezing welfare benefits in order to provide room for tax cuts. Uh, now, some of your backbench colleagues think that's a good thing. They think tax cuts are vital to boost the economy pre-election. Is, is this a live cabinet discussion? Well, look, that's a matter for the autumn state. It's a matter for the chance. I, I do just want to... No, I'm just asking if you guys in the cabinet talk about well, it. Well, as you know, I can't talk about what happens in the cabinet. It's the whole purpose of you the cabinet. You can tell me what the agenda as you, is. As, no, as, as you know, I can't, I, can't, I can't talk about it. But I think the really important thing to notice is that 
and it's relevant to prisons. So this government put in £94 billion to support people uh, when the cost of living, particularly in respect of gas and electricity. To put that £94 billion in context, you know, the total prisons budget is around about £5 billion. So very, very okay. significant sums going in. Okay. And that's before you consider freezing okay. fuel duty and so on. But you're, you're a big cheese now in the Cabinet. If the Chancellor came forward this suggestion, would you be personally comfortable with the idea of squeezing benefits to provide tax we cuts? We must do everything we can for the most disadvantaged okay. in society. No, but it's important because that's why we put up that's why we put up benefits by 10%, 10.1%, okay. and also you know, universal credit, but also uh, uh, the okay. uh, pension as well. So we want to ensure, I will want to ensure, my colleagues okay. will want to ensure that we are decent, humane, and that we support people. I'm taking that as a no. <laughs>